Uh, good evening. We're very pleased this evening uh, to have Claire Install from the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust um, talking to us about the work that the Trust does uh, on uh, living landscapes. Um, so without further ado, uh, over to you, Claire. We're looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Claire Install. I'm Senior Conservation Officer at Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, and I've been with the Trust for over six years now, so quite a while, and um, I, I oversee all of our wider countryside work. So tonight I'm going to tell you a bit about our Living Landscapes projects. So I'm going to start off with a brief setting the scene, very brief. Um, I'd also like to mention a few other talks that um, you might find quite useful to watch in addition to mine, and these are talks that you've had the Lit and Phil Society. So John Clarkson's talks on the Nature Recovery Network and also Biodiversity in Leicestershire in 2040. Those are both really good sort of to, to boost these, this talk. Um, I haven't gone into the level of detail and a lot of this that John has, and um, they're good to watch additionally as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's gonna be available, but Craig Bennett also did a talk on 30 by 30, which is something that I'd recommend um, you, you watching as well. And, as, as was mentioned earlier, Julie Attard's talk on the Charmwood Forest project um, may also give you a bit more information about a project that I'm going to talk about our involvement in today as well. So, so other places to find a bit more information. Uh, and I'm going to give you a bit of information specifically about what living landscapes are and also our two um, active living living landscapes in Leicestershire and Rutland, which are the Charmwood Forest Living Landscape and the Saw and Reek Living Landscape. So setting the stage, um, in 1992, the Earth Summit was held in Rio de Janeiro. And one of the outcomes of that was that the UK Biodiversity Action Plan was set up in 1994. Um, and this led to local biodiversity action plans and species action plans. Um, since the BAPS, we've also had 2011 to 2020 decade on biodiversity and the ACA targets. Um, none of that's gone brilliantly to plan, as you'll probably be aware. Um, but also alongside that, there were other things going on as well. So RSBPB set up Futurescapes and the Wildlife Trust set up something that is continuing today, which is what I'm talking about, the living landscapes. So I'm just going to read this off this slide to you because it's, it's the kind of um, quotation from, from the Wildlife Trust vision. And evidence shows that we are continuing to lose wildlife and wild places at an alarming rate. A landscape scale approach to conservation where habitats are bigger, better managed and more joined up lies at the heart of the Wildlife Trust efforts to address this. We call this living landscapes. So the living landscape vision was dreamed up by the Wildlife Trust in 2006. It's a national scheme and it, there are living landscapes across the whole of the UK. Uh, as it suggests, it's landscape scale cons conservation and it's defined on geological or topographical features. Um, and also reassuringly, the Lawton Review that came out in 2010, which asked for bigger, better, more and joined up wild places, um, is fully in line with the approach that we're already taking. So um, we're already doing, doing the right things. Um, so a, a brief, um, very brief explanation of, of the ideas behind living landscapes and indeed the Lawton approach, which those other talks that I mentioned earlier will go into a bit more detail on that. Um, so the idea is that we look at large areas of land, we identify areas of good habitats. Um, right now, a lot of our good habitats are fragmented and isolated, uh, which means that species can't necessarily move between them. And that makes the species and habitats that are reliant on, on those good, good areas of, of habitat um, more prone to, to change like pollution or climate change. And that, that could wipe out whole populations if they've got nowhere to move to when disaster strikes. So the idea is that you connect up habitats with corridors, you make habitats bigger, you make them better quality and, you, um, and more, more of them. 
and therefore there'll be more options for species to go to and they'll be much more resilient into the future um, with the, all the challenges that we are due to due to come up against um, and even localized challenges as well um, or, or climatic challenges or a drought or a flood um, so so the idea is that we'll create a functioning living landscape and wildlife can survive into the future but along with the living landscape it also encompasses people if people don't care about where they live if people aren't able to use their landscape um, we get a lot out of our land, even thinking about things like um, the, the geology of Charmwood has led to quarrying, and that is an important part of the economy. Um, so we have to consider all aspects of the landscape and how people use it, how people can work with nature and make it more resilient. And without people on board to protect places, we're not going to get anywhere. So part of the living landscape is is approach is about working with people where people and nature can thrive together and bring all the multiple benefits that arise from that. So looking at the Charmwood Forest living landscape, this living landscape was launched in 2011. So it's been around for about 20, 10 years now. Um, and initially it was set up with funding from aggregate industries. It's now being delivered the work has been delivered through the Charmwood Forest Landscape Partnership Scheme. And this area has long been recognised for an area that is important for wildlife and also geology. It's got international importance for its geology and um, it's really quite unique. It's got a distinctive upland landscape and is about 17,000 hectares in size. So this map just gives you a brief overview of the purple boundary is our living landscape boundary. And the red boundary is the Charmwood Forest Regional Park boundary. And you can see, I, I have to confess, I don't have the mapping software here. Um, so I haven't been able to update the mapping layer. There are a couple of triple SIs that are missing off the, the triple SI layer. Um, so there, there are two more triple SIs in the area as well. But this, this map just shows the triple SIs, the Leicestershire and Wildlife Trust nature reserves, which are the areas that are kind of purple, um, and also all the settlements as well, just to give you an idea of, of where it is and, and what's, what's within it. So I mentioned it was special and it's got 22 triple SIs um, covering over 8.2% of the area. And when you compare that with the, the percentage of triple SIs covering the whole of Leicestershire and Rutland, it is considerably higher. Uh, it's got a national nature reserves and we've got eight local um, Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust nature reserves as well in the area. And there's an awful lot of local wildlife sites as well, covering 5.5% of the living landscape area, which is a lot a larger area than if you look at the, num the coverage of local wildlife sites over the whole of the two counties. So it's a really rich area in Leicestershire for important sites for wildlife. And just drilling down into the local wildlife sites a bit more, just to kind of give an idea of the mix of habitats. As the name suggests, there's some woodland, Charmwood Forest, but there's also a lot of nice grassland in Charmwood Forest as well, a lot of neutral and acid grasslands. And there's some lovely streams and um, obviously water bodies and mature trees as well, and hedgerows, but the, the grasslands are, are especially lovely in the Charmwood Forest, um, I have to say. <laughs> So looking back to the funding that we received from aggregate industries, it was section 106 funding, and this enabled us to employ a part-time project officer to oversee the Charmwood Forest Living Landscape project. Um, it also gave some money towards a small grant scheme as well. So during the nine years between 2011 and 2020, we visited 72 sites. They've either been visited or surveyed and management advice given. And in some cases, this is a lot of management advice and a lot of visits to a single site. So it's not just a brief visit, it's a full survey and advice given on how best to manage the site for wildlife. Um, also in 2016, we started our monitoring scheme looking at vegetation, butterfly and birds. And also we helped with the designation of two sites of special scientific interest, Holly Rocks Fields and also Johnson's Meadow, which is in 
wood house eaves. So um, that was something that was really nice to come out of it as well. So looking at the small grant scheme, there have been 34 projects that have been funded. And this was just um, small grants that just help landowners do work to improve their sites for wildlife. So it included dry stone wall repairs, fencing, hay cuts, interpretation boards, etc. And in addition to all of the work that I've already mentioned, we've given training in various species, we've given walks, and we've given talks on the species within the Charmwood Forest. We've also utilised a lot of volunteers, some of them who are here today, so thank you very much. Um, and without them, we would not have been able to do a lot of the work we've done on our reserves within the Charmwood Forest. Um, I've listed a long list of things that volunteers have done, but it's, it's a much bigger list. And um, it's all helping to maintain the habitats and protect the habitats within the Charm Forest that we manage. And oh, it's, it's great that we are able to, to do this with the help of our volunteers. So a lot of um, hours have been spent managing habitats within the Charmwood Forest as well. And also, as well as aggregate industries, uh, providing the funding for one of our posts. We also have a pretty good relationship with them and we help manage their estate at Barden. Um, as well as manage it, we also carry out surveys for them. So um, you can see the slow worm in, in the bottom corner. Uh, that's a slow one that I saw this year when I was carrying out reptile surveys on the site. Um, we also survey their bat boxes um, and owl boxes and breeding birds and vegetation. So th there's a lot of work that goes on and there's a lot of lovely habitats within the site. And it's, it's nice to be able to work with Barden um, to hopefully get that site managed as, as well as we can for wildlife. So coming up more recently, uh, when I first joined the trust, I became involved with the Charmwood Forest Regional Park, um, which was a partnership that met up. Um, and out of that partnership, uh, the Charmwood Forest Landscape Partnership Scheme has been developed, which is a large project. And I'll go into the current form of the project in a while. But initially, there was a development phase of two years. It's a National Lottery Heritage Fund funded project. And they initially funded two year development phase, and now they're funding the delivery phase. So the development phase. Um, there was lots of work done by, by many partners and it was very far reaching from arts to geology is the key theme throughout, throughout the, um, the project um, to food and tourism and business and th there's a lot involved um, as you will hear from Julie in March. Um, but we, we carried out a biodiversity audit in 2019 and the reasons for doing that was to create a baseline um, for the habitats and species that were present in the Charmwood Forest. We did some basic analysis and we wanted to identify um, opportunities to inform the development of projects for the delivery phase of the project. So part of that we did what is off, we, we did some um, habitat mapping and we looked at how different species move through different habitats. We did that for woodland, grassland, heathland, mire and fen and water bodies. Um, and we also held some workshops to look at priority areas for habitat um, improvements. And also we came up with some indicative species, who, which are species that might indicate the health of a particular habitat and also some iconic species, which are good species to um, used to tell the project about the, people, the public about the project um, and enthuse people about the project. So um, the mapping exercise was something that I'd especially wanted to do for the Charmwood Forest for, for quite some time. So it's really nice that we were able to get that done um, and able to use that work. So moving on a couple of years, we're now in the delivery phase of the project and it's a big project, it's 3.7 million. And most of that is being supplied through the Heritage Lottery, although there are other partners who are providing some funding as well. It started in July 2020, although our involvement started, I think it was July 2020, 
one was when our project started with it. Um, don't quote me on that. It, it might have been June, actually, thinking about it. Um, and it's running to June 2025. And it's there's 18 organisations involved. And also there are 18 individual projects. And our projects are just part of those. So here are some of the partner organisations. As you can see, it's a really wide range of people. <clears throat> Excuse me a minute. And some of them are people that we hadn't worked with before. So it's actually a really useful project for engaging with new partners. And also, um, I'm a member of the steering group of the project, and it's really nice. We've got quite a close knit steering group, so it's really nice to actually get to know people a bit better. Um, and through meeting up, we can discuss other areas of work that we can perhaps work together on. So aside from the benefits of the project it's also really useful to have that extra networking opportunity to try and further the work that we're doing to improve um, the conditions of wildlife within the two counties wherever we can so it's great for that reason too this is you see in the other slide but this is just an overview of the area of the project the project area is marked in the green outline um, and it is a bit of a fuzzy outline. If there's something just on the outside of the boundary, the project will, will consider it. It's, it's not a set and stone boundary, but you have to put a boundary to these things. Um, but but that, that's the main project area. So there are the projects, the 18 projects fall into three different um, themes. So the first one is Explore Charnwood, and that's trying to get people out and accessing Charnwood outreach projects and also the visitor economy. Um, understanding Charnwood is more about the history, the archaeology, outdoor learning, interpretation, and also there are arts projects as well within that, that project area. And then Care for Charnwood, which is where we fit in. Um, and these are managing and protecting the landscape and also geo heritage conservation as well um, and there's a big natural flood management project and also stone walling and heritage skills training and um, these are the projects that we're doing there are three key projects one is recording one is focused on spiders in particular um, uh, I, I recall from one of John's talks, Leicester is the spider hotspot of, of the UK or England, so um, quite topical. And also the third one is grassland. So the recording project is, it was going to be meeting in the field and having monthly recording sessions with, with volunteers, but due to the pandemic, we've changed that to online training. And then we have monthly Zoom sessions, which are an hour long and anyone's welcome to join. And all of those sessions are then put up onto our web, our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to catch up on any of them, go and have go and check them out. Um, we also have weekly social media posts about species that make the Charmed Forest special. And also the project has enabled us to continue with the long-term monitoring that we started in 2016. Um, which is really good because it's really good to be able to have specific staff time to dedicate to support our volunteers um, and train new volunteers as well. We're hoping to recruit some more for, for next year and the following years as well. So the butterfly surveys, uh, we carry out four transects, which are um, circular walks, around the countryside on a nice day. Um, and th those are carried out between April and September, inclusive once a week. And we do two transects on one site and two on another. And these are repeated. And um, we're, we're now getting to the stage where we've got five years of information. Um, and it's it's getting to the point where where we're going to be able to do some proper analysis soon we, we've been able to do um basic analysis as you can see we compare the overall number of butterflies and there's there's several other elements that we can compare and we're considering more elements to compare um which is quite exciting but it, it's nice that we're getting to this stage where we can look at the data and start to think about 
what it means, which is which is really exciting. Um, and also one thing that I should point out is if we just look at the time volunteers spent between June and September, um, bearing in mind the surveys started in April and the bird surveys are throughout the whole year, we have 410 hours of volunteer time spent on that project, which is massive. And um, it's just something that we could not do ourselves as staff. It's we're, we're very grateful for the volunteers that spend time carrying out these surveys for us um, and extract some really useful data that should hopefully guide habitat management into the future as well. Um, the bird surveys. <laughs> One of the highlights actually of, of my weeks when um, the surveys are taking place or, or months in the bird surveys um, aspect is that I get sent photos from the surveys and I particularly like these two from the bird surveys. Um, it, because birds are quite small and often quite far away, you don't often get a huge amount of bird photos, but this tawny owl, um, young tawny owl was just it just made my day seeing that and um, the, the deer just just looks so funny peeking up there. Um, Dave, thanks for your photos. <laughs> Dave, Dave is watching. So thank you very much. They're great. Um, and again, same with same as the butterfly surveys, you're actually able to look at comparing year on year what we're seeing. Um, I've just put some snippets of um, a summary survey that the volunteers produced. Um, in April 2021, and um, it was noted that despite the shortened surveying period, the number of bird species at Transect B during 2020-2021 was at its highest level. Um, and also we're able to look at firsts. So during 2020-2021, we had five species that we hadn't seen before on the Transect. Um, and this is all information that if we weren't doing the surveys, we wouldn't find this out. And um, as time goes on, we should be able to find out a lot more, um, which is really exciting. So moving on to the grasslands project. Um, this project aims to provide habitat improvements at at least 15 grasslands and support five landowners. We're also looking to train five volunteers and in grassland surveys and also train volunteers and staff in hand scything. Um, and there is an aspiration to do guided walks and talks, which unfortunately due to COVID haven't happened this year, but hopefully will be happening in future years. Um, and this, this part of the project, I mean, the, the scything training, I took part in it um, as one of the staff that um, participated and it was on a scorching day it was so hot um we we did sit in the shade when we could um but it it was um it was a fun day and it was great to do something that felt quite natural it wasn't um lots of loud machinery it was just the swish of the blade um and and it was great it was also great to spend some time with some great people as well so over a couple of days, we've got 11 volunteers trained up, one landowner joined in with the training, and also we've got four staff trained. Um, and following the training, uh, the, the volunteers that took part in that have helped us manage some of the grassland as well through, through scything. So it's, it's all kind of feeding into the same project, um, which, which is great. And also coincidentally with the, um, Charmwood Forest, there is a quarry in Charmwood Forest that produces the best whetstones for sharpening sides in the world. And so that's a nice coincidence that comes back to Charmwood Forest, which, which is really nice. Um, as part of the Grassland project, we started doing a lot of surveys. Um, our aim was to get 50 hectares of grasslands included in the project. Um, we've managed to get 48.94, so we're almost hitting that target and we've got two years left. Um, but ideally, we want to be getting the final two this year so that we can look at the results in the, the following year. Um, we've worked with nine landowners and land managers, and we've had 11 volunteers helping us with the surveys, which, again, we're extremely grateful for. Um, and hopefully they, they all enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and again, 
an incredible amount of volunteer hours, 600, over 617 volunteer hours spent carrying out the grassland surveys, which is just incredible um, and really great. And hopefully at the end of it, we'll have some grasslands in better condition to show for it as well. So following on from the surveys, we then have been managing some of the grasslands. Um, we've done a few different techniques. So we've used a cut and collect machine because a lot of the grasslands, um, large farm machinery can't fit on. So the cut and collect machine is a bit smaller. Also when you're hay cutting, raking up the hay is, is quite a task. So the cut and collect machine collects everything up. Um, the scything, we, we've done, which was quite a lot of work. It took quite a few days to, to, to do the sites that we did. Um, and also we, we've cut some of the sites for hay. Um, a couple of the sites have had some seeds. One of them has seed spread on it um, to hopefully from a local source. Um, and another one had green hay. It was near to one of our reserves, well, pretty much next to. Um, and we, we took some green hay from one of our reserves and spread it on this site to hopefully um, get a better species mix on that site going into the future. And rounding off the year, we had a barbecue for the volunteers as well, as we discussed earlier. Uh, and it was really great to be able to meet everyone outside um, and have some great food and discuss how everyone had found the project so far um, ways to move forward with it and considerations for next year and also played a couple of games as well so it, it's just nice to be able to um, say thanks to the volunteers for all of the work they've done for us uh, and the final part of the project that we're involved in is spider surveys which are being carried out by a spider expert um, over two years and we're looking at six key sites within the Charmwood Forest to do extensive surveys of all species and then we're targeting about 12 sites to look for the Charmwood spider um, which is found in Charmwood and also the Sherwood Forest as well. Um, so, so we're trying to see if we can ascertain the presence of that, that particular species and following on from the surveys we will be providing some recommendations for habitat management as well. So this year we completed surveys on four of the key sites. Um, and unfortunately, I've got no photos of this to show you. Um, so maybe maybe next year I might have some photos. <laughs> but um, that, that's something quite exciting to be, to be involved with. So that's all good. Now, moving on to the Store and Reek living landscape. And this living landscape, um, I should start off by mentioning that we have a dedicated member of staff, um, Claire, and uh, this is the only photo I've got of her. She joined us last January um, and we've, we've mainly been meeting on Zoom, but we did get on, out on site at Barden to do some surveys and um, we, we found a tiny newt, um, not of the protective variety, that we, we we moved and put to safety, but it was absolutely gorgeous, as you can see from Claire's face. Um, and Claire's, Claire's focusing on developing a long-term strategy for the Sora and Reek living landscape, and also working up a shorter, maybe between three and five year project to deliver some parts of the strategy. Amongst other things, she's also been delivering um, the ID training for the Charmwood Forest project and several other, other roles as well. So, so she's been busy. Um, and these are, this is um, part of a presentation that Claire did on the Saw and Reek, which is available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to find a bit more about the Saw and Reek specifically, you can check out that talk as well. Um, so this Saw catchment is the gray area on the map um, and the river Saw rises in the south of the county and moves northwards and it joins the River Trent at the Nottinghamshire border. So if you look there, you can see the dark lines in the middle are the rivers, the Saw going all the way up and the Reek, which is going from Mountain 
it's the River Eye before it gets to Mountain, then it turns to the River Reek and joins the River Saw just north of Leicester. And you can see the dark areas on the map are the, the immediate flood zone and our living landscape boundary that we've put is a buffer around the flood zone. So it's that purple boundary that you can see is the, the Soren Reek living landscape area. So the total area of the Soren Reek is over 26,000 hectares. And um, there's 134 kilometers of river. There's a decent 14 triple SIs, um, a lot of local wildlife sites, and there are 57 parishes along the whole of the stretch of this project. So it's, it's a pretty big project area we're looking at. Um, this photo shows the river saw at our Croft Pasture Nature Reserve. And the, band, the banded demersal is, is a species that you'd often see on slow, sl slow flowing rivers. And I've seen plenty of them along the saw. So I wanted to include that as a particularly beautiful species, I think. So just to give a bit more wider context to the, to the living landscape area um, or to the, the saw. So we have our saw and reek living landscape, and then we have, which is the purple, bluey purple, dark Y shape. The gray surrounding that is the saw catchment. The Trent is the, the river Trent is the green line. And this all is part of the Humbert River Basin and it goes out at the top there near Scunthorpe and goes out to sea. So just looking back at the living landscape, um, we, we've done a bit of work in the area to date. So we've acquired over 400 acres of land in the soil floodplain since 2004. A lot of this is at our Cossington Meadows Nature Reserve, which we've actually done a lot of habitat restoration work um, to create a mosaic of habitats. And we, we tried to have a, a kind of extensive grazing model there. Um, and it's, it's, it's great. It's got large water bodies. It's got plenty of wetland birds. It's got rough grasslands. It attracts the um, short-eared owls some winters. It also has starling murmurations. Um, and it's got plenty of dragonflies and damselflies because um, it's next to the river and also has the water bodies as well. Um, we also have reserves Loughborough Big Meadow, we have Croft Pasture and Narborough Bog as well, and also Mount Sorrel and Rothley Meadows and Marshes. <laughs> uh, so, so quite a few reserves along the saw. Uh, in 2011-2012, we surveyed the soil throughout Leicester and also looked at its associated green spaces, places like um, Aylstone Meadows. And these photos below, there's, there's the one to the left is Cossington, and the one to the right is Loughborough Big Meadow. And there's an emperor dragonfly as well. That one was at Mount Sorrel and Rothley Marshes. And I just wanted to kind of take a break at this point um, and just share with you this video that I took on my phone. So it's not a professional video, um, but I think it kind of reminds you of why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing. And it is amazing to see the starling murmurations. I'll just press play now um, at Cosington. And I saw this one this last winter and it was, it was just lovely to go there. Uh, it's, it's not far from my home and be able to see this, this um, wildlife phenomenon, really. It's, it's, it's pretty special. Um, so as you can see, they do a little ribbon across, which just, I think, looks incredible. Um, and I'm hoping that you can see it where you are, <laughs> that you're not just seeing a, a bumpy image. Um, but I just wanted to share that as a little interlude that it is, really important that we protect these special places and make them resilient and allow nature to continue to thrive into the future. And this is one of the reasons why. So moving on a bit, um, looking at the Soar and Reek living landscape and some of the overarching objectives, uh, the strategy isn't yet fully developed, but some of these are the objectives that Claire's come up with. 
Um, and they're, they're all um, very sensible <laughs> objectives. So um, I'm going to go through a bit of information in, of each of them in turn, so I won't read them all out now. Um, but the first one is rivers are in better condition. And all these statistics are really shocking. Um, a lot of our rivers are in bad condition. Um, a lot of our water bodies, not just rivers, but water bodies are not good due to physical modification. Um, and only 16% 16 of our water bodies are close to their natural state. There's pollution, there's flooding, there's disconnection from the floodplain, there's litter, there's um, runoff from agriculture, runoff from roads, sedimentation, phosphates, there's barriers being put in the river. Um, it's, it's not good at the moment and we hope that things will improve with, with work to the Soren Reek. Um, and <laughs> core sites um, should be better connected. So I spoke earlier about the Lawton, Lawton principles, um, bigger, better, more enjoined. An isolated site is not as resilient as a site that is joined to other sites. So if we look here, there's some key sites. We've got several reserves here. So we've got Cosington, we've got Mount Sol and Rothy Marshes. There is Watermead, which is not owned by us, but it's, it's a great wetland site. Same Aylstone Meadows, which is owned by the City Council, and that, that's a great site for wildlife as well. And then we've got a couple of reserves in the south. And it would be really good if these could be a bit better connected um, through, through working with partners. Um, one thing that I should actually say in terms of the living landscapes is that we are not viewing living landscapes as something we're doing on our own. It's something that you need to work with partners, whether that's landowners, whether it's local authorities, whether it's local experts, um, whether it's members of the public, uh, it's, it's projects that need to be partnership and need in partnership and need to involve everybody for them to succeed. Um, so going back, <laughs> um, it'd be great to see the priority species thriving. These are just a few species that are uh, mentioned in, in the Leicestershire and Rutland Local Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, and it would be great to see these more often. Um, unfortunately, the news today that both House Martins and Swifts, amongst others, are being put onto the red list um, kind of shouts out the urgency for, for these priority species to be bolstered and, and be able to thrive and and this is something that we'd like to enable um also just just looking specifically at a few of the priority species wetland specialists so you've got the lapwing you've got common data um grass snake great crested newt bullhead and also ragged robin there so looking at communities better connected how, we, how do we intend to do that? We intend to get people involved through habitat management and habitat creation, education. We do a lot of work with schools and we have an education team who do a lot of work with, with communities. So getting them involved and also allowing people to use the sites for walking, for enjoying wildlife. Um, people need to see wildlife to appreciate it, to protect it. So it's so, so really important to get communities involved. Now thinking a bit more specifically about how we might achieve our objectives. One key thing that we're looking at at the moment is using natural processes, um, working with water, grazing, reducing intensive management. Got one of our, our uh, lawn mowers there, one of our longhorn cows. And also working in partnership, as I said a minute ago, it's really important that we work with people to achieve this. It needs to be a shared and common goal, not us working on our own. So um, we welcome people to come along with us um, and, and help us or, or us help them um, to, to the, achieve the same goals. 
Uh, we'll get out surveying and monitoring to see whether our actions are having the impact that we want um, through regular site visits, looking things like vegetation monitoring or species monitoring as well. And enabling communities to take action. So we can provide advice, we can signpost to information and we can train people and educate them um, and also bring people together. So all of the things that we've spoken about. Now, I'm just gonna talk a bit about working with water or I'm gonna let a few other people do the talking about working with water as I'm gonna show a few videos in a moment. So please let me know if this works because I've got to share a different screen with you um, to show you this video. So I would say talk amongst yourselves, but um, okay. You're all in different rooms. So this, this is just the last two and a half minutes of this video. And it's talking about um, how topography affects water mo moving through a river basin. And there's one example on the left and one example at the right. And please let me know if you can't hear it. So what we've created here is two contrasting catchments. They've both got roughly the same gradient from the top of the catchment down to the bottom of the catchment. But as you can see, this one here has got a much straighter channel. It's also got very straight, steep tributaries feeding into that channel. Um, and there's a settlement that we've put at the bottom there. So those little Lego bricks are representing houses. This side of the catchment is a much more naturalised looking catchment. We've got a meandering river channel. We've got some trees planted around. We've got some woody debris in some of the channels. We've also got small little runoff attenuation features. And what we're going to do is introduce rain into both of these catchments and see how quickly the water flows down the catchment and how much is actually stored in the upland areas of the catchment. So you can see that in the straight catchment, the water's moved and it's already at the bottom of the catchment. It had quite a lot of velocity, it moved really quickly and it's flooded that settlement. In the more naturalised catchment with a meandering channel, the water is taking a lot longer to reach the bottom. And that's because the gradient of the channel is a lot shallower because it's got further to travel. We can also see that in the more naturalised catchment, there's quite a lot of water that's staying up in the catchment and is being stored by some of the little features that we talked about earlier. To reduce the risk of flooding in the settlement at the bottom of the catchment, we can build engineered flood defences. We can just represent these with just some Lego bricks here and position those in. Then if we rain on the catchment again, we can see what difference that those make. So you can see that that wall has now protected the settlement from flooding. As well as introducing engineered defences to reduce the risk of flooding downstream, we can also slow the flow of water in the upstream catchment areas by introducing various measures, such as creating storage areas, introducing leaky dams and planting trees. So we'll just rain on this catchment again and see what difference that's made. So you can see that the woody debris and uh, leaky dams that we've put in the channel are slowing the flow, they're reconnecting the floodplain to the channel and we can also see that there's quite a lot of blue in the upland areas of the catchment showing that we've managed to store some water further upstream. Oh, sorry. It's... Oh, 
Oh, sorry about this. Um, you couldn't hear it, but the video kept playing. <laughs> so I've had to just stop it. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, Nicola, I've seen you've put a chat question in. Will the Sewing Week project include its tributaries? Um, we haven't fully decided yet. It's um, at the moment we've included the kind of buffer area around the, the two main rivers, but that will obviously include some of the streams leading into it. So um, I can't say for sure, because it depends which tributaries we're talking about, but potentially, um, yes. But there's also other work going on by other partners, which may cover some of the tributaries as well. Uh, but that's, that's to be decided, I think. Does, does that answer your question okay? Okay, <laughs> it's a bit strange talking to, to a, a virtual audience who are all on mute. Um, okay, so moving on from that video, so you saw a bit about the um, natural solutions that we can use um, and, and that we, we kind of would, would consider using as part of our project. Um, and, and we've actually been fortunate enough to be involved with the project um, at our natural flood management, which included our Narbra bog reserve, and that is located here. Um, and I'm going to share another video with you, which gives you a bit of insight into that project. And this video talks about two projects, one in Norfolk, but also um, one at our, our reserve as well. And it's, it's about four and a half minutes long. So I'm going to stop sharing this and, and try and share the video with you. And again, let me know if there's any issues with the sound. We know that flood resilience is like a jigsaw with many different pieces needing to come together to complete the picture. Natural flood management is an increasingly important part of resilience and it's an area that Atkins have been working in for over 10 years. Louise Beale went to see two of their projects to find out more. To the untrained eye, this section of the River Wensum in North Norfolk may look like any other. Yet this stretch of water is actually very significant. It's part of the most advanced river restoration project in the UK. The scheme uses nature-based techniques to help reduce downstream flooding. Those behind the project say it also helps improve natural habitats. We've employed a lot of techniques to improve the habitat uh, condition and the habitat complexity of the river. From quite significant bed raising, where we have put material back into the channel, which was historically removed as a result of dredging activities, to much smaller measures such as creating low level berms, which just act to constrict the flow at key locations, to improve the flow character for target plant and animal communities, in line with the river's important uh, national and international designation. The project has been running for 10 years and covers over 70 kilometres of watercourse. Around 30 kilometres has been worked on so far. As part of the restoration scheme here, they've been using many different techniques, including some quite simple ones, like putting a large piece of wood into the river to change the flow of the water and create lots of different habitats around it. Here in Norfolk, the scheme has had a significant impact on the wider community too. The main aim for the drainage board with this project was to really improve the ecology of the river and to bring it for, to a more favourable condition under the Water Framework Directive. The byproduct is that through narrowing the river, 
we reduce the amount of silt that is deposited along its length and that actually reduces the amount of maintenance we have to do and focuses it on certain areas. So not only is there ecological improvements, there's also improvements with our maintenance, there's improvements for the wider environment and ecology of the area and also for um, the flood risk benefits that have come about through slowing flow in the upper reaches. The learnings made on the River Wensum are being put to use on other projects, including this recently completed one in Leicestershire on the River Saw. Here they are also using technology to monitor how effective the natural flood management features they've put in actually are. Behind us you'll see there are sensors upstream and downstream of the feature, and what we're trying to understand is how that wood that you see behind you is actually slowing the flow of water during a flood. And obviously the other thing as well is we can't really get out here to measure things safely during a flood. So actually having this technology is also helping us capture much more information, to be honest, than we would have been able to do any other way. The scheme here is part of the largest natural flood management programme of work for the Environment Agency. They're hoping it will help protect local people from flooding. We're in changing times, we've got a climate emergency, carbon has been talked about a lot more. Um, we know that we just can't keep building walls ever higher and higher, so we've got to look for other solutions. And natural flood management and other nature-based solutions are really just part of the jigsaw in what we can use to try and tackle flood risk, but also improve water quality and restore habitat as well. The River Saw project has been embraced by those protecting wildlife here, as it's close to the unique nature reserve, the Narbra Bog. Not only are we helping people who sort of live downstream in terms of be protected from flooding in the waters, the action of water, but also we're, you know, we're positively having an impact on biodiversity and wildlife and able to kind of communicate to new audiences about maybe finding out how that fits in on their land, talking with other landowners and farmers and seeing how this could be appropriately delivered elsewhere as well. The data and learnings being gathered here are vital for the future. The team hope by early next year they'll have a fuller picture of how helpful the measures have been, not just for people, but for the environment too. We know that flood res resilience is like a... Okay, I'm going to take you back to the presentation now. Can you see the presentation? Give me a thumbs up, Ken, because you're the only one that I can see if you can see yeah. it all right. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. That's great. Okay, so th this is just a little bit about that short video that you saw um, a link to where you can watch it again should you wish to. I also need to mention that it was made available on the CIWEM website and it was produced by ASN Media detailing Atkins work um, and we were we, we were a partner of, of that project. So you can see that we're working with other people as well as part of the Soren Week Living Landscape. And uh, now moving forward to the smaller project that I mentioned, and the project that we're thinking about is a species-based project, trying to reverse the decline of three iconic species within the Soren Reek. So looking at the barn owl, which is um, a species associated more with rough grassland, agricultural areas, etc. cetera. Um, the water vole, which is obviously a riparian species, and swifts, which are an urban bird. Um, all of which are in decline. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the swift has now been moved to red list. So that is desperately in need of help um, and, and nest areas in the UK. Um, so, so far we've held some species workshops on the three focal species. And we've begun to draft ideas for the project to put together um, an expression of, in, of interest for a potential funding bid. Um, looking forward, we want to work with a range of partners with this project. So if anyone wants to get involved, I'm going to provide some details later on. Should, should you be keen on that, grab a pen. Um, also building on existing programs um, 
working with others if, if other people have started um, a project we want to work with them what can we do to bolster what they're doing to benefit these species um, and in the, in the development phase we'll, we'll look at mapping the key threats and behaviors and developing the work streams and producing a summary summary document um, that can then um, we'll have a development phase and then we'll have a longer delivery phase to actually deliver the benefits for these species. Uh, well, that's the idea and the hope. Um, so, so far, uh, the project object, objective is to connect, educate and enable communities to take action to reverse the decline in swift, barn owl and waterfowl populations across the Soren Reek living landscape. And we're going to have three themes. Um, one is engaging. So that's to do with educating, enthusing communities about these species, um, then enabling, so giving people the tools required to take action uh, and sustainability. We want this to provide benefits well into the future and for future generations. And the, there'll be these themes embedded into three main project areas. So the first one is connecting communities and raising awareness of key issues. Second one, shared understanding to improve baseline data to target our actions. And thirdly, creating habitats, so creating, connecting, going back to the Lawton approach and managing habitats. Um, and this is a photo of, of some of the canal boats that are along the shore. So if you want to get involved, Claire Sambridge is the person to contact and I've put her contact details there. Please, please get in touch if you're interested in, in finding a bit more about this project. Um, not this week, she's on leave, but um, after that. So looking forwards, uh, there's quite a lot going on at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to really kind of touch on this, that internationally we've got the Kungmin, Biodiversity Conference that started in October online and is being finished face to face in 2022. Um, that was put back, that's, that was COP15. And we've also obviously had the Climate Change Conference COP26. So looking to the outcomes of that and actually the actions that are gonna take place as a result of that conference. In the UK, we've had quite a few recent um, developments over the past, say, three years or so, and we've also got some imminent changes that to look forward to. So we've got the government's 25-year plan, the Environment Act that became an act in November um, that had had a long time coming as the Environment Bill, um, and now it's finally become an act, and that we'll be looking at nature recovery network strategies, um, there's also legally binding 2030 species abundance targets. There's biodiversity net gain being introduced in the planning system and mandatory 10% net gain, and also strengthening of the NERC Act as well. In addition to that, we'll be having a new agri-environment scheme, which is looking at public money for public goods. And um, it sounds like it's going to be good for wildlife. So watch this space, but it's something that we will hopefully be able to draw upon to help um, manage, sorry, my cat's just jumped on the desk, <laughs> to help manage the environment a bit better and, and improve um, the prospects of species and also enable us to work with landowners in a positive way as well and where they can get financially rewarded for the good that they are doing as custodians of our countryside. There's also a couple of funds that have come on board and then there's a 30 by 30, which is a wildlife trust um, campaign that we want 30% of land and water being managed for wildlife by 2030. And um, the government's come on board with this. It's Wild Belt, which is looking at the areas that aren't protected um, and, and how they might be in the future. Um, I haven't read up on that recently, but but that's that's another another thing that's coming into play. And then also recently there, there was the Discupta review, which looked at the economics of biodiversity. Um, so, so there's a lot of things happening uh, that that will give us tools to deliver for the environment. Um, locally, we've uh, been talking with a local partnership. Um, about how we're going to allow nature to thrive in Leicestershire and Rutland. And 
we've got some seed corn funding um, to as a pilot for a trial area of biodiversity opportunity mapping and also developing the partnership further. So we want to make sure that the right people are involved at the right times um, and, and we can actually deliver what we want to deliver as a partnership. And it's vital that we do this as a partnership moving forward. And some key areas of our work stream will be the Nature Recovery Network, the Nature Recovery Network strategy that are part of, that's part of the Environment Act and also deciding how best we can use the tools that are coming into play in the very near future um, in Leicestershire and Rutland most effectively. So there's a lot on the horizon that's quite exciting. Uh, and, and there's a lot of local people who are wanting to work together in a positive way. So fingers crossed for a brighter future. Um, and finally, I thought I'd just put a few actions for you in case you're sitting wondering what you can do. Um, every space is important for nature, no matter how big or small. Um, David Attenborough gave a speech, I think, a few years back, saying every road verge is important now, every garden is important for wildlife. So no matter how small your garden is, there might be something that you can do for wildlife. You could dig a pond, you could leave a bit of your garden wild, you could have a compost heap. There's lots of lots of good things that you can do in your garden. Go peat free. Um, don't use peat compost. Peat is a, a very important natural resource and it's also um, great at sequestering carbon. So it's important that the peat stays in the peat box. Um, and also you could volunteer for the Wildlife Trust. And um, we have a lot of information online um, in our Action for Insects campaign, which gives you a guide of what you can do to take action for insects. So if you wanna find out more about what we do, you can visit our website and I've given you my email address there. <laughs> Cue lots of questions tomorrow morning, um, should you have any questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Claire. Um... That's a, a, a beacon of hope in, uh, in, in rather bleak times. Um, are you happy to take some questions? As long as they're nice ones. Okay. Um, so if anyone wants a question, you can either put it in the chat window if you want to, to put your hand up virtually uh, using Zoom. Any questions for Claire? While, while people are scratching their heads, can I ask one? Um, yep. I, I was down at, uh, at Narbra Bog uh, last week um, and uh, there, there was one overwhelming thought that occurred to me. Um, rather than all this uh, very expensive civil engineering, um, where are the beavers? Uh, <laughs> a couple of beavers could achieve much the same thing for a hell of a lot less money. When do the beavers arrive on the, the soar and reek living landscape? Um... According to our head of conservation, he thinks they'll make their way naturally at some point in the future. It's just a matter of time. Um, I, I think it's an ongoing discussion, isn't it? I, I cannot answer your question because um, it's, it hasn't been answered. I mean, there, are, um, there, are, there are guerrilla beaver releases in other parts of the country. Of course, I'm yeah. not advocating such illegal action, but... Uh, you know, there's there's no shortage of beavers in the UK now. They are burgeoning. Well, they're in Derbyshire. They're now in Nottinghamshire. So, yeah, like John says, it might only be a matter of time before they they make their way down here on their own accord. But um, at the moment, they're mentioned quite frequently, but I don't know of any concrete plans. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, you know, uh, I think uh, Narbra Bog uh, is just crying out for beavers, really. Um, talking, so going on with the theme of iconic species, a question from uh, Alan, uh, yeah. and, and thinking about Charnwood more, uh, another iconic species, hen harriers. Uh, will they be back? Um, I, again, I haven't been involved in specific discussions regarding hen harriers. Um, one of the approaches that I take is if you get the habitat right, then the species should come. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that's going to be the case with these, but I would al always advocate 
getting the habitat right. And once we've got the habitat working as a landscape, once we've got corridors for species to move through, thriving habitats, hopefully we'll get the species to follow. And, and um, that's, that's what you can hope for, isn't it really? But you've got to get the habitat right before you put any species anywhere. I have been involved in a white-faced data, which is a, a rare species of dragonfly reintroduction project in a previous role. Um, and we did an awful lot of research into the habitat to get that perfect before we did any reintroduction. And there's so much to consider, um, but hopefully habitat's right. They'll come on their own accord, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's a few other um, questions. So the, the attitude of landowners now, I am slightly one step removed from the landowners. It's usually Claire and Uta that go and talk to landowners more often than I do, um, as, as they're, they're the leads on, on the living landscape projects. Um, but I've certainly felt the last few years I've been at the Trust, there's been a lot more partnership working between organisations in Leicestershire and Rutland. There's a lot of positivity, people wanting to work together. Um, I, I spoke to someone a few years back who was quite high up in the NFU and he was very, very much on board. And I think the way that the ALMS system's going where landowners are gonna be paid to do things for wildlife, um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see a, a a big change in attitude. I mean, I'm. I guess the, I can't say there's a negative attitude because that sounds like I'm saying that. But I'm. Hopefully, there'll be more incentives for land managers to do things, even if it costs money, because they'll get reimbursed for that. And at the end of the day, farmers need to make a living. Um, but I've spoken to farmers who are very positive towards wildlife and who want to do all that they can. Um, yet still still make their living and if they can do that they will do that so yeah i i would i would hope so that um that everyone would be brought on board but you can't speak for everybody um and and as i'm not on the direct line like uta and claire are i can't say for sure but i i am positive so we've got a couple of questions about Charnwood. One, one, one from Jeffrey um, is: Is there likely to be any extension to the course of the project due to the delays caused by COVID? Um, the the project is running until twenty twenty five, and our grasslands project is due to run I think till 2024 but there's if there is money left in the pot we will be able to extend it having said that um, the trust is currently looking at our strategy as a whole um, and it may be that we look that this project needs a legacy it may be that we look to do more in the Chalmwood Forest following on from the project um, we don't want to do a lot of work and then leave it Having said that, if we feel that the work's done, every, every, everything's great, then um, it's best to deploy our, our efforts elsewhere. But I certainly wouldn't like to leave anything half done or hanging in the balance. Um, and that, that's certainly not the attitude of the project. You need to have a legacy. So um, I can't say anything for sure because nothing's been set in stone, but it would be nice to think that the good work is continued and the, the, the habitats that we're protecting continue to be protected and we can do as much as we can to ensure that. Okay, and, and one more question on Charmwood um, from Peter about connecting important sites together. Can you, can you say anything more about that? Um, I can't really going to specifics because I don't want to mention landowners specifically um, but we did use the mapping exercise to try to to ensure improved connectivity um, 
and and we will be looking at that at the end to see whether that has has made a difference um, and in addition to our project there's also other projects that are taking place so there's a forestry project that the the national forest are leading on and there's also um a small grants for landowners project that will also put money into land holdings in the charmwood forest and there's um the natural flood management project which is on one large land holding in the charmwood forest um so is it does that answer your question enough peter <laughs> I think it probably does. Um, so we've, we've been going for quite a while now, so we should probably start drawing to a close. So um, can I uh, do what we normally do and hand over to Hazel um, to uh, give a, a formal thank you? Yeah, Claire, that was fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as somebody who is actually a volunteer in quite a few aspects of the things you mentioned, I especially love the way you've actually pulled it all together and it's given me a much better understanding of, of, of the background to the work that there's quite a few of us here on this um, programme tonight. Quite a few of us, we, we know bits and pieces of what goes on, but you've actually done a brilliant job in actually pulling it together. So I certainly have a bigger understanding and, and I did have a bit of an understanding because of being involved in it, but I'm sure people who've not been involved in it will really have a good idea of what's going on. I think one of the things that is important and everything you're saying is to make sure that people understand what is going on at the trust. And I think you've done a brilliant job tonight. Thank you very much. The other thing I'd like to say is um, um, Cosington Meadows, um, I think it was about 10 days ago, um, the, there was this, a, a group of us, 15 of us from this section of the Lytton Phil had our um, winter field trip there. and. We all, was people who'd not been for years, were so impressed with the improvements. And it, right at the end, we saw the starling murmuration, although there weren't as many starlings as in your picture, and they didn't stay together, but it was still a, a superb experience. I think we all stood there and thought, yeah, there's something really good going on here. So we were very grateful for the trust for what they're doing there. So in general, thank you very much, Claire. You've, you've certainly clarified a lot of things in my mind and I think you will have done for other people as well. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>